Allah Akbar. And how did your appointment go? Next week. Next week. Till now, happened. I don't do photos. How's Abdul Hafiz? He's okay. Did he go swimming or something today? Yeah. Did he go? Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> 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 Alhamdulillah. 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 وعلى آله وأصحابه وبارك وسلم تسليما كثيرا كثيرا أما بعد فأعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ومن يتق الله يجعل له مخرجا ويرزق من حيث لا يحتسب وقال سبحانه وتعالى إن الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما وقال حبيبنا صلى الله عليه وسلم اللهم إني أسألك الهدى والتقى والعفاف والغنى أو كما قال عليه الصلاة والسلام رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل الأقدة من لساني يفقه قولي سبحانك لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم رب زدنا علما بالقرآن العظيم وبسنة رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم الحمد لله رب العالمين Today is the 15th lesson of Riyadh al-Salihin the work of Imam al nawi Rahimahullah Ta'ala and we are concluding the chapter of Muraqaba and inshallah we will also be trying to conclude today the chapter of Taqwa so there's three ahadith left before we move on to Taqwa so inshallah we will swiftly move forward with these three ahadith these two chapters they kind of go hand in hand the theme of the last few weeks has been um, how me and you can connect with Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala Sometimes because of the way our lives are and the way we've orientated our lives through education, through uni, through work, our foresight and the way we look at things has become very negative. We only see things the way we want to see things. We think that everything is just as simple as whatever's in front of me, whatever's on the plate. But we forget that Islam isn't just based on a mere text, mere recitation, just looking into the apparent of things. Rather, the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it wasn't just that the Quran was revealed to me and you in book form, and that's it. We, there was a whole chain, there was a whole connection between ourselves back to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also has a very spiritual side to it. It has a side where we have to work on our hearts, where we need to focus on trying to get those in, this, in our hearts away from our hearts. So, Babul Muraqab and Babul Taqwa kind of touches on those t- topics. 
So this next hadith is a very beautiful hadith where Imam Muslim and Imam Bukhari, rahimahumallahu ta'ala, they both mention this hadith. From Ani Abi Huraira radiallahu ta'ala anhu annahu samia nabiya sallallahu alayhi wa sallam yakul. Our most beloved Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam mentions one of the ways to get to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and if I may say so, the fastest route to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is through your connection with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Through him, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed me and you to find Quran, to find this, this beauty of Islam. He is that individual that we look towards. And our Allah becoming happy with those, it depends on how much we can connect to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam also. Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu is a very special man, a very special companion. Whenever he writes uh, and he, whenever he narrates hadith, sometimes we find in the works of hadith that he'll say, you know, Samiatu Khalili, I have heard my beloved Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam say, I have heard my friend say, I have heard the closest person to me say, I have heard that man who has found a place in my heart, such a place now that he's engraved his name, his life inside my heart. I have heard him say. So the way they spoke regarding Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you can feel the love that they had for Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Inshallah, when we get to Babu Taqwa, I will mention an incident from the life of Abu Huraira, which can be found in Al-Adab al So Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala anhu says that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa informed the companions of a story of three men from the people of the past, from the Banu Israel. Inna thalathatan min Bani Israel abrasa wa aqra'a wa a'ma. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa informs us regarding Three men. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wants to tell the companions regarding three men. One was a leper, one was a blind man, and one was a bald person. A person that has no hair. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says that Arad Allahu ayyabtilahum fabaatha ilayhim malakan. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decided that he wants to test these three individuals. The leper, the blind person, and the one that has no hair. Fa'atal abrasa faqal. So first and foremost, uh, an angel is sent by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to all three of these people. The first uh, person to be met is the leper. The person who has a skin condition. A person, we know that they have leprosy. It's a very severe skin condition through which a person uh, potentially has lost much of their apparent life. Your skin your, is damaged and it can cause many more severe problems in life. And he does for a person also. فَقَالْ أَيُّ شَيْنْ أَحَبُّ إِلَيْكَ This angel said to the person that what do you love the most? O oh, you leper, what do you love the most? The man replied, قَالَ لَوْنٌ حَسَنٌ وَجِلْدٌ حَسَنٌ That I wish that I could have pure skin. That I can have beautiful skin. I want good skin. And I want to look good. Obviously he's been suffering all his life. He wants to look good. وَيَذْهَبُ عَنِّ الَّذِي قَدْ كَذِرَنِ النَّاسِ and to the extent that I want to look good and people have been bullying me. People have been doing unjust to me. They have frowned upon me. I want that feeling to go away now. I can't take anymore. Where people are looking at me, they look at me in the sight of disgust. They don't like what they see. And I don't like that feeling anymore. I don't want that anymore. فَمَسَّحُوا فَذَهَبَ عَنْهُمْ قَذْرُهُ وَأُعْتِيَ لَوْنًا حَسَنًا so this angel touched this leper and it happened to be the case that he had beautiful skin. Launan Hassanan. He had a very beautiful complexion and beautiful skin. Qal, فَأَيُّ الْمَالِ أَحَبُّ إِلَيْكَ Then he was asked to the man, to this leper, that what wealth do you love the most? What would you like? Qal, al-ibulu aw qal al-bakaru shakka al-rawi fa'u'tiya naqatan ushara faqal barakallahu laka fiha. The leper said that I would like it so that I have camels, flock of camels. I don't want camels. I want to have camels, she camels, so that I can have the best. Obviously, at the time uh, before Islam, and if we talk, look back, a camel was a great asset. A great asset that we find that to have even one red camel, or one she camel, is the today's you know, BMW, today's Mercedes, today's very beautiful, luxurious car. That was the worth of a camel. So... The angel said, may Allah Ta'ala give you barakah and blessing in this, you may have this. فَأَتَلْ أَقْرَأَ فَقَالْ Thereafter, the angel went to the bald person, the person that has no hair, that you know, naturally has no hair, hair doesn't grow, and he has no hair, so he went to this person, أَيُّ شَيْنْ أَحَبُّ إِلَيْكَ What do you love the most? قَالَ شَعْرٌ حَسَنٌ وَيَذْهَبُ أَنِّي هَذَا الَّذِي قَذَرَ النَّاسِ I love it so that I could have beautiful hair again. I would want to have beautiful hair, and that people do not 
frown upon me, they don't look, uh, in, look at me in a very negative light because I'm a bald person, I have no hair. But if you look around, sometimes a person doesn't have eyebrows and they don't have hair and people look at them in a very negative light. Some people would assume that maybe they've got an illness, maybe they've got cancer, whatever it may be the case. We shouldn't judge so easily. Sometimes, naturally speaking, a person doesn't have any hair. I know of a friend, a uh, very dear friend of mine too. He, you know, some people used to look at him and he used to say to him that, you know, why don't you let your beard grow? You know, you've got a very beautiful complexion, you've got a small beard here, why don't you let your beard grow? So many times he never said anything. Never did he say anything. That why do you let your beard grow? He came to a point where people kept on saying to him, that, you know, why do you let your beard grow on the side? You've got very beautiful skin, very beautiful beard. Why do you let it grow? One day he couldn't take anymore and he actually started crying. It was a gathering of four or five of his friends and he said that, Bye, guys, I do want to tell you, but I'm going to tell you. My beard doesn't grow. I've got a skin condition on the side of my face. I have a rash due to which my hair doesn't grow on the side of my face. That's why I don't have a beard. So he didn't want to say, but he had to, you know, feel as though he was forced to say the truth, that this was happening to me. It's a skin condition, it's a condition. He desires to have a beard, but he can't have a beard. So here this person says, I want hair. فَمَسَّهُ فَذَهَبَ عَنْهُ وَأُوْتِيَ شَعْرًا حَسَنًا The angel touched him and blessed him, and it happened to be the case that now this man was blessed with hair. Hair started to grow. قَالَ فَأَيُّ الْمَالِ أَحَبُّ إِلَيْكَ Which sort of wealth do you love the most? He said to this bald person. The angel uh, asked. قَالَ الْبَقَرُ فَأُوْتِيَ بَقَرَةً حَامِلًا The person said, I would, look to, I would love to have cattle. You know, a flock of cows. I would love to have cattle. So he was given many, a cat, uh, many a cows and they were all pregnant. حَامِلًا Pregnant cows. So you can imagine that he's going to have a huge, huge amount of cattle. You know, in the next year or so. وَقَالَ بَارَكَ اللَّهُ تَلَكَ فِيهَا May Allah give you a blessing in this. And now the third person, فَأَتَى الْأَعْمَى فَقَالَ The angel came to the blind man and said to him, أَيُّ شَيْنَ أَحَبُّ إِلَيْكَ What is the most beloved thing to you? What would you like? And obviously a blind person, you can imagine what a blind person would want. قَالَ أَيَرُدَّ اللَّهُ إِلَيَّ بَصَرِي فَأُبْصِرَ النَّاسِ I would want it to be the case that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives back my eyesight so that I may look at people, so that I may see the beauties of this world. فَمَسَّحُوا فَرَدَّ اللَّهُ إِلَهِ بَصَرًا The angel blessed him and touched him and his eyesight was returned. قَالَ فَأَيُّ الْمَالِ أَحَبُّ إِلَيْكَ What is the most beloved wealth to you? What would you like? قَالَ الْغَنَمْ I would like sheep. فَأُوْتِيَ شَاتًا وَالِدًا فَأَنْتَجَ هَذَانِ وَوَلَّدَ هَذَا He was given many a sheep and the word sheep in English you can't say sheeps. It's sheep. The plural is also sheep. I can remember in school I used to get told off because I used to say sheeps with the S. And my teacher in Radcliffe school used to say to me, Atik, Atiko, it's not sheeps, it's sheep. In plural, it's still sheep. Don't say sheeps. And now I, I pretend to teach English GCSE and my uh, employer is sitting here too. So he's going to think, OK, I need to make sure I don't make a mistake when I say sheep and not sheeps. So this person was given sheep. Many a sheep to the extent that now these sheep are obviously going to have lambs. It came to a point where the leper who was given the camels, he had so many camels. And the person who was given the cattle, he had a huge stock of cattle. And then this blind man who has now been given his sight back, he has many a sheep. Now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to test people. And my Allah and your Allah, if this doesn't happen in our lives, then I swear by Allah, in a different form, Allah is testing us. This is a very extreme case where Allah has decided to test these three people. But in a different form, I can guarantee you there is a test that either has come to our lives or it will come to our lives. Here, the angel now is being resent to all three people. The leper, the blind person and the one that has no hair. ثُمَّ إِنَّهُ أَتَى الْأَبْرَسَ مِنْ فِي سُورَتِهِ وَهَيْئَتِهِ The angel now comes in the form that he himself is a leper now. He himself has that skin condition. فَقَالَ رَجُلٌ مِسْكِينٌ قَدْ انْفَتَعَتْ بِالْهِبَالُ فِي سَفَرِ Now this person comes and says that I am a very poor person. My means of travel has come to an end. I have nothing. فَلَا بَلَاغَ لِلْيَوْمَ إِلَّا بِاللَّهِ ثُمَّ بِكْ I only have hope in Allah. I can only ask from Allah thereafter I ask from you, O young man. Can you help me? أَسْأَلُكَ بِالَّذِي أَعْتَاكَ اللَّوْنَ الْحَسَنِ 
how blessed you are that Allah has given you such a beautiful complexion. I am one who does not have good skin. Allah has blessed you with this. Well, Jild al Hassan, you have a very beautiful form, beautiful skin, and beautiful complexion. Well, mal, and I can look towards your camels. You have so many beautiful camels. Ba'irun ataballagu bihi fi safari. Can you give me even one camel so that I may continue on my journey, so that I can have something and I can continue? Faqala al hukuku kathiratun. So the man replies, the previous leper saying, Oh, I have too many responsibilities. I'm a busy man. Oh, I don't have time. al hukuku kathira. So many things, so many things I have to do. فَقَالَ كَأَنِّي أَعْرِفُكَ أَلَمْ تَكُنْ أَبْرَسَ يَقْذُلُكَ النَّاسِ فَقِيرًا فَأَعْتَاكَ اللَّهُ So the angel replies saying to him, It is as though you don't recognize me. Do you not recognize who I am? You are that man. You are that man who was a leper. You are the one with the skin condition. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed you with all this. And now, you are acting like this with me? This is the way you are responding to me? This is the way you are dealing with me? فَقَالَ إِنَّمَا وَرِثْتُ هَذَا الْمَالَ كَابِرًا أَنْ كَابِرٍ So the leper says, that, No, this was given to me from my forefathers. This, was, no, this is something that I've had all my life. This wealth, my skin, my complexion. My forefathers gave this to me. I've had this all my life. فَقَالَ إِن كُنْتَ كَاذِبًا فَصَيَّرَكَ اللَّهُ إِلَى مَا كُنْتَ So the angel says, if you are a liar, then may Allah return you to that thing that you, which you were before. And the angel passes by. وَأَتَ الْأَقْرَى Obviously, as you can imagine, he returned back to his normal state again. وَأَتَ الْأَقْرَى فِي سُورَةِ وَهَيْئَتِهِ فَقَالَ لَهُ مِثْلَ مَا قَالَ لِهَذَا The angel went now to the bald person, the one that had no hair who was struggling to have hair, and now he has been blessed with this hair, and he said the same thing to him. That I am a, he came in the same, you know, the way that the bald person was bald, now this angel came in that same form. But please help me, I have nothing. This bald person, which was previously bald, he, re- he replied in the same way. He said the same thing, that, oh, this has been in my family, this beautiful cattle that you see, it was given to me. This beautiful hair that I have and everything that I have, it was already in my forefathers. I've already had it from before. فَقَالَ إِن كُنْتَ كَاذِبًا فَصَيَّرَكَ اللَّهُ إِلَى مَا كُنْتَ The angel says and replies, if you are a liar, then may Allah return you back to your previous state. And obviously, he was returned back to his previous state. Who's left now? There was a leper, there was a bald person, and who's the third person? A blind. وَأَتَ الْأَعْمَى فِي سُورَتِهِ وَيَأْتِهِ The angel now went as a blind person, and he went to the previously blind. فَقَالَ رَجُلٌ مِسْكِينٌ وَابْنُ السَّبِيلٍ إِنْ قَطَعَتْ بِالْحِبَالُ فِي سَفَرٍ He said, I am a blind person. I am weak. I am a poor person. I am a traveler. And my means of transport has come to an end. I don't have anything. Can you help me? فَلَا بَلَاغِ الْيَوْمَ إِلَّا بِاللَّهِ ثُمَّا بِكْ Obviously, my reliance and me asking is from Allah first and foremost. Thereafter, I ask you, O servant of Allah. أَسْأَلُكَ بِالَّذِي رَدَّ عَلَيْكَ بَصَرَكَ شَاتًا أَتَبَلَّغُ بِهَا فِي سَفَرِ Can you spare me one of your sheep, one, so that I may continue on my journey? Can you spare me this? Allah is the one that has given you all this. فَقَالَ كَدُكُنْتُ أَعْمَى فَرَدَّ اللَّهُ إِلَيَّ بَصَرِ Now the blind person says, قَدْ كُنْتُ mm. I was actually a blind person myself. I was actually a blind person myself. فَرَدَّ اللَّهُ إِلَيَّ بَصَرِي May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He returned back my sight. Allah returned back my sight. فَخُذْ مَا شِئْتَ وَدَعْ مَا شِئْتَ Take not one sheep. Don't take two sheep. Take whatever you want. وَدَعْ مَا شِئْتَ Leave behind whatever you want. فَوَاللَّهِ I swear by Allah. مَا أَجْهَدُكَ الْيَوْمَ بِشَيْنْ أَخَزْتَهُ لِلَّهِ عَزَّ وَجَلْ I swear by Allah, whatever you will take today, I will not hold you to account. I have been in this situation myself before. I know what it feels like. I know what it feels like to be in this situation. So take whatever you want today. I will not ask from you. I will not ask anything back from you. Just take whatever you want. فَقَالَ أَمْسِكْ مَالَكْ The angel replies saying, Keep hold of your wealth. فَإِنَّمَا أُبْتِلِيتُمْ You are all tested. You three that I have been sent to, you are tested. فَقَدْ رَدِيَ اللَّهُ عَنْكْ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from the three has become happy with you. وَسَخِطَ عَلَىٰ صَاحِبَيْكَ And Allah has become displeased with, his two, the, with your two other friends, meaning the leper and the bald person. Here the ulama explain a very important point. So many different rulings can come from this uh, incident. But the point that me and you need to focus on is, 
be true to yourself, be true to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Whatever favor you have been given, it is not from your part. It is not from me, it is not from you. It is only, only from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you are one who is comfortable in wealth, then remember that time maybe where you were struggling. If today you are happy and content with your family, with whatever you have, it's possible that there was a time in your life where you weren't happy. It's possible you are going through a, a very difficult patch. But Allah has given you now. So if that is the reality, know that you need to always look towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And when someone else comes to you and someone else shares their difficulty, then don't forget that you are also part of that difficulty. The way Allah helped you, now it's your turn to help back. That is our test. And wallahi lazim, you will find in your life, definitely, definitely, that you are in a good state. You've gone through hardship. Now you've turned your life. Now Allah will bring to you such people who will remind you of your past. They will remind you of what you did back then. They will remind you of your sins. They will remind you of your faults. But that moment, that reminder isn't to bring you down. That reminder now is to say that you got through it because Allah helped you. Now your friend needs help. Now you need to help him. You need to become a means of goodness for him also. Why is this under the chapter of Babu al-Muraqaba, where a person is focusing upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Because the reality is, good times, bad times, whatever you have in your life, always remember, everything is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now Imam Nawawi says, عن أبي يعلى شداد بن أوس رضي الله تعالى عنه عن النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم قال شداد بن أوس رضي الله تعالى عنه He is someone that you should remember. When we did Al-Adab Al-Mufrad, I mentioned there was a hadith there where Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was mounted with one of his companions. And this companion was very eloquent, he was very wise. He knew poetry. He started to recite poetry of a man from the people of Arabia from pre-Islam. And Rasulullah loved the poetry so much. Rasulullah said to Shaddad, Shaddad, continue. Shaddad says, I continue to recite, recite, recite until I recited 100 couplets of poetry whilst mounted with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. At that point I mentioned to you that to be mounted and then to be reciting poetry, to be listening to poetry is also a sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. I asked my respected teacher, Shaykh Abdul Rahim Hafizahullah, that is it okay for me to make such a comment? He goes, yes. So I said, Ustadji, I said to my friends that to listen to nasheeds, which will motivate you, which will make your attention go towards Allah whilst mounted, whilst driving in your car. If you are listening, does it have an effect? Yes, my Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, whilst mounted on his vehicle, he also listened to nasheed, he also listened to couplets that made him feel good and made him remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Who is Shaddad ibn Aus? He was made a governor from Usman radiallahu, uh, Umar radiallahu ta'ala and made him a governor. And after the demise of Uthman radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he moved to Palestine. He moved, uh, moved to Philistine. He passed away in the year 58 after Hijri. And from him the Ummah has been blessed to receive 50 ahadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Is Muhammad here today? <coughs> Muhammad. <coughs> this is a hadith that uh, one of my dear friends we literally studied just this week. Where in Shaddad ibn Aus radiallahu ta'ala anhu and in Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam qal says that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says Al-Kayyusu man dana nafsahu wa amila lima ba'da li maut Indeed the truly intelligent is that person dana nafsahu who controls his base desires who has a control over his base desires wa amila lima ba'da li maut and he works, he acts and he does such actions for that which is going to meet him after death Wal-Ajizu, the fool the person who is completely, you can say, a very foolish person. Who is he? Man atba'a nafsahu hawaha. He who, are here, he who allows his desires, his base desires to be in control of him. He allows his base desires to rule him. And watamanna ala Allah. And whilst disobeying Allah time after time, allowing his desires to take over, doing whatever he wants, whatever she wants. And at the end of the day, watamanna ala Allah. Allah is going to forgive me. It's okay. You know, you can carry on doing sin. That is a foolish person. My Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and your Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam informs us that that person is very foolish. So foolish to think like this regarding Allah. That are you playing a joke with Allah? That it's okay to continue living a life of desires and living a life where it suits you and then saying to yourself, Allah will forgive me. 
Shaitan has this concept in his mind. Shaitan, we find in a hadith of my Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that once my Rasul was very extremely upset. Extremely upset. Why was he upset? He met with Shaitan. And Shaitan and Rasulullah conversed. And Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said to Shaitan, that, do you not feel anything? That you will be the means of so many of my ummah and so many people going to the fire of Jahannam. That do you not fear Allah? Do you not understand what you're doing? This very shaitan says to Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Yes, I am doing whatever I may be doing. But I was also in Jannah at what point. And in Jannah I was allowed to read a few verses and a few sentences that were written in gold. Those sentences say that if a person recites these very kalima, these very words, then no matter what sin he has done, Allah will, allow, Allah will forgive him and give him Jannah again. So shaitan says, I know them words. So before death comes to me, I will recite those very words and I will go to Jannah and all of you will be going to Jahannam, those that I have led astray. Upon hearing this, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam became displeased, upset, that he's going to do this, take everyone to Jahannam and at the end, he's going to say a few words where the mercy of Allah is going to come showering down and he's going to be forgiven. How can that be the case? Jibreel alayhi sallam informs Rasulullah, seeing him in distress, the Messenger of Allah, not to worry. He right now may know those words, but before death comes to him, he will be made to forget those words, so he will not be able to recite them. He will also be burning the fire of Jahannam. Allah Allah is so that whatever we do, whatever good we do, we focus our attention on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Forget people. Forget trying to please people. If you try to please a room of 50 people, I swear by Allah, you may please three. But as soon as you get to the fourth person, you would end up displeasing the three that you already pleased. So why not just focus your attention on pleasing Allah? Please Allah, and I swear by Allah, everyone around you, those that don't want to be pleased with you, they will become pleased with you. Make your focus Allah alone. And don't have very foolish thoughts regarding Allah. That Allah forgives. Yes, Allah can forgive. Not when you make a mockery of Allah. Not when you try to play a game with Allah. That I'll carry on, it's okay, it's okay. No. A believer does not do that. A believer, when he trips, he accidentally trips. He doesn't sin on purpose. He doesn't make these silly remarks. Allah will forgive me. It's okay. It's okay. It's not okay. Why are you challenging Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Why are you making out that Allah will definitely forgive? The way Allah can forgive, have you forgotten? Allah can severely punish also. Have you forgotten that there is something called the anger of Allah also? The way there is the mercy of Allah, there is something called the anger of Allah. So what can we do? Become the intelligent. Continue striving. Try, try, try. Continue li- 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 living such a life. We are trying hard. Try, try. And prepare for the hereafter. This world is only 60, 70 years, if that. And are we willing to sacrifice eternity for these 60, 70 years? It's not worth it. The masters are adopt. Nothing that's all. We should be working towards the hereafter alone. The next hadith from my Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa is... عن ابي هريره رضي الله تعالى عنه قال قال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم من حسن الاسلام المرء تركه ما لا يعنيه رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم says the excellence of one's islam is that he lets go of those things that don't concern him you know today we become so busy in everyone else's life that what's happening next door have you heard that's happening this is happening or oh, did you hear the argument did you hear them say this and they said this and that no that doesn't concern you. Your concern should not be that. My concern and your concern should only be me becoming a better person, me making an effort on myself, on my family, and those around me. Why have we become so nosy in everyone else's problems? Why? My Rasul وسلم, says that whatever doesn't concern you, it is in Islam, it is in the excellence of your deen that you let go of them things. Because we're so nosy with everyone else's business, we forget ourselves. We are so busy trying to find out everyone else's life. We forget that our lives and our moments are ticking away. And then when we wake up, why did I waste my life and my time thinking about his problem and her problem and the things that they're doing when I should have been busy trying to focus on my life? This is what is meant by this hadith of my Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Imam Nawi rahmatullahi alayhi says to me and you that make Allah your focus. Make Allah your focus. Make Allah yours. If Allah is yours, then you don't have to worry about anything. Make Allah yours and then all these you know, minute things in your life, they'll disappear. Then you won't be nosy looking at someone's life. You'll be busy thinking, Ya Allah, I've got so many things to sort myself. 
I'm so lost in my own little world. I need to sort myself out. Do I have time to be nosy and gossiping about regarding everyone else? No, no time for that. I've got so many changes that I need to make in my life. Babu Taqwa. The chapter of Taqwa. Before I say what the meaning of Taqwa should be, I will explain to you the how Imam Nawi rahmatullahi alayhi very beautifully, whenever he starts a new chapter, he always starts with the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Nawi says, قال الله سبحانه وتعالى يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته الله سبحانه وتعالى says oh you who believe oh you believers fear Allah سبحانه وتعالى the way he is ought to be feared fear Allah the way he should be feared Imam Nawawi also says وقال سبحانه وتعالى فاتقوا الله ما استطعتم the fear Allah as best as you can he also says that Allah says وقال سبحانه وتعالى يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا the all you who believe fear Allah سبحانه وتعالى and when you speak speak only what is right وقال سبحانه وتعالى ومن يتق الله يجعل له مخرجا ويرزق من حيث لا يحتسب and this is probably one of the greatest verses of the glorious Quran listen to what Allah is saying to me and you that person who has taqwa I'm not going to translate taqwa anymore I will tell you inshallah what taqwa is That person who has taqwa يَجْعَلَّهُ مَخْرَجَ Allah will make way for that person Allah will make an avenue Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will make a way out for that person وَيَرَزُقُهُ From every trial, from every difficulty وَيَرَزُقُهُ And Allah will provide for that person مِنْ حَيْثُ لَا يَحْتَسِبْ In such ways that you won't be able to even comprehend and understand that how on earth did this come to me? That, whoa, how did this happen? You won't be able to even imagine how Allah has looked after you. But here was the condition. That person who has this gem called taqwa. If you have something called taqwa in your life, makhraja, nothing can harm you, nothing can do any wrong to you. Why is this taqwa? Imam Nawi rahmatullahi alayhi through these next few two, three hadiths, he's going to explain his point to us. What is taqwa? To understand it, we need to kind of relate it back to ourselves. In our lives, we have many loved and dear people in our lives. Those of you that are married, you will find that your spouse, your wife is very dear to you. Those of you with parents, you will find that your mother and your father is very dear to you. Your children are dear to you. <coughs> we very wrongly misinterpret the word taqwa. When we say, you know, brother, have taqwa, fear Allah, fear Allah. No, no. That thought is very disgusting. That word in English does not do justice to the word taqwa. That fear Allah. What does it mean, fear Allah? Am I scared of my creator Allah in that way? No. Are you scared of that creator in that sort of way? No. That fear Allah, that Allah is going to judge you. Fear Allah. No. That's not the meaning of taqwa. If I love someone and I really, really love them, then your love makes it a point that if I love someone and this person means so much to me and you want goodness for them, then you will do what you cannot to displease that person. You will do such actions that I don't want to displease that person. That if you have a father, a mother, you, what do you fear? Do you fear my mother? So if I did something wrong in front of my parents or my dad or my mom, it's not that I fear my mom and dad. It's the hurt that if I do this, my mom and dad are, going to, are not going to be happy with me. I fear the displeasure of my parent. I fear the displeasure of my spouse. I fear the displeasure of my friend. With Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, why is it that our relationship is this? That Allah is above and beyond and I'm scared of Allah. He's going to throw me to Jahannam. No. Fear, taqwa means that you are scared of making Allah unhappy. He means so much to you that you don't want to make him unhappy. So when you trip, you feel like, Ya Allah, you mean that much to me. If I was to do this in front of my family, in front of my spouse, they won't like me for it. And I don't, I don't like seeing them unhappy. Oh Allah, I've displeased you. I, I don't like it that you're unhappy with me. That's called taqwa. That's called that I fear the displeasure of Allah. I don't want my creator to be unhappy with me. If that concept of taqwa enters our life. Wallahi lazim, we may sin, we may still fall. But I swear by Allah, you will be amongst those that as soon as they fall, straight away they stand up. Oh Allah, forgive me. Tawbah is the first thing, but taqwa, tawbah. 
that they have this concept of taqwa in your life that I don't want to displease my creator. You've slipped somewhere. Straight away, oh Allah, forgive me. I, I didn't mean to do that. Oh Allah, please forgive me. This is the concept of taqwa that we need in our lives. Imam Nawi, rahmatullahi alayhi, he continues to explain a few points regarding this. And Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala anhu qal, Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala anhu mentions, Abu Huraira has been coming so many times in a hadith. We know that through him the ummah has been blessed to have over 5,000, to be precise, 5,374 ahadith from Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala anhu. This Abu Huraira is very special in our monthly al adbul Mufrid class. It's coming up, this very hadith regarding Abu Huraira. This is very relative because when you love your family, you want the best for your family. You want the best for your wife. You want the best for your children. You want the best for those around you that mean a lot to you. And wallahi, let's, let's be honest and selfish. The reality is we love our families dearly. I love my actual biological brother, my brother, my sister so much so. <clears throat> Probably more than any other brother. It's a natural thing that you love them. Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala accepts Islam in the seventh year of Hijri. He only has approximately three years, if that, with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. One day he comes to Rasulullah, distraught, unhappy. Ya Rasulullah, why is he unhappy? I've accepted Islam. I'm a believer. I know now I'm working towards Jannah. I've ticked the first stage, which is you have Iman, now you're on the road to Jannah. Abu Huraira says, Ya Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, my mother's not a believer. My mom is not a believer. And Ya Rasulullah, how can it be? She's not a believer. Make dua for my mother. Make dua for me. Make dua for my mother. Rasulullah starts to make dua. Ya Allah, make Abu Huraira, make the mother of Abu Huraira beloved to you. In, from, in one narration of this Aladu Mufrad hadith, we find my respected teacher mentioned that as soon as Abu Huraira saw Rasulullah lifting his hands and is about to make dua, Abu Huraira now runs from the gathering of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He runs away from the gathering of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa He goes towards the house of his mother. And as soon as he goes to the house of his mother, his mother has just bathed. She's just had a ghusl. She's just come out. Before he can say anything, we find in the hadith, she says, Ya Abu Huraira, O oh, Abu Huraira, Aslam to. I have accepted Islam, Abu Huraira. So the commentators explain why. Why does he run? Why, do, why does this happen? Abu Huraira wants to know that will the dua of Rasulullah reach my house before I will reach my own house? Will you reach my mother before I reach my door? I want to test the who will reach faster, me or the dua of my Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But that's concern though, because you want the best for your family. No one here is sitting here, no matter how far your family member may be. Wallahi lazim, hand on heart. Though you'll be happy seeing your friends on thee, you want your family members on thee, because they mean a lot to you. It's a natural love. You want your spouse to be very close. You want your, the way you have Allah or you're trying to go towards Allah, you will try to lift your partner in that too. You will try to lift your siblings in that. You will try to lift your parents in that. But we have to have that concern. You know what's the greatest test? My Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, in our lives, we do it different. I'm sitting here in a gathering where right now, I don't have my siblings here. It's possible that my siblings are not listening at home either. I'm sitting in front of an audience where you're my dear brothers in Islam and my dear sisters in Islam are listening, but you're not my family in that way. My Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when he's there about to announce Islam, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it's easy. In front of you, it's easy. You don't know my private life. You don't know how I am. It's very easy in front of you. My Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, how do they test his Rasul? The Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Muhammad, for you, the task isn't to tell just these folk and random men and random women to come to Islam. Your task is... Go warn your family members. Go to those that are closest to you. Go to those that will challenge you the most. Go to those that have seen you grow, they've seen you grow up, they've seen you for the last 40 years. And now for them to accept the effort you will need to make with them, Wallahi, is more than a mountain of effort that you need to have on else. Allah, he trains his Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And from his family members, his uncles don't accept. His dear uncle that was there for him for over 10 years of prophethood, there for him. On his dying moments, Ya Ami, Qul La Ilaha illallah. Oh my dear uncle, just say it, please. Just say La Ilaha illallah. I will be witness for you on the day of Qiyamah. I will stand for you. I will make you so that I speak in the court of Allah. That, oh Allah, this is my uncle Abu Talib. Oh Allah, he accepted Islam. I will be witness for him. 
at that moment Abu Jahl and all those around him don't allow Abu Talib. So Abu Talib says that I'm not gonna let go of the way of my forefathers. I can't let go. You're my nephew and I accept what you're trying to say, but I can't let go. Rasulullah he leaves distressed, distressed. That the person who was there for my family member, I couldn't even do anything for him. That's what Allah says. إِنَّكَ لَا تَهْدِي مَنْ أَحْبَبَتَ O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, first of the Qur'an revealed, you cannot guide whom you love. The esteem of Allah doesn't work with emotions. It doesn't work with who you love. وَلَكِنَّ اللَّهَ يَهْدِي مَنْ يَشَاءَ It is Allah. He guides whoever He wants. It doesn't mean that we stop. It means that it's not up to you anymore. You've got to try. You have to try. It's a lifelong effort. You have to carry on trying. But at the end of the day, I always remember, I can try, 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 try. The ultimate guidance is only from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And you know what wins a person? It's not the bayan. It's not the talk. It's not what I'm doing here. It's the character at home. It's who I actually am at home. Am I that person who's smiling at home? Am I making that kind of effort at home? That's what wins a person's heart. Because when you come on to deen and they see this, then they realize that, whoa, it's not that he's just praying salah. It's not that she just praying salah. It's... It's the character. It's things have changed now. And that's the actual effort that we need to work towards. This is of my Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So Abu Huraira says, Taqila ya Rasulullah man akramun nas. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was asked, Tau Rasulullah, who is the most noblest of people? Qala atqaakum. The noblest of people are those that have this concept of taqwa. And taqwa is to fear the displeasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Faqalu laysa an hadha nas'aluk. O Messenger of Allah, this isn't what we're asking you. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, فَيُوسُفُ نَبِيُّ اللَّهِ ibn نَبِيِّ اللَّهِ ibn نَبِيِّ اللَّهِ ibn خَلِيلِ اللَّهِ That, oh, okay, you're not asking me that. Then the most noblest of people is Yusuf alayhi salam because he is a prophet of Allah, a messenger of Allah, who is the son of a messenger of Allah, who is also the son of a messenger of Allah, who is the son of Khalilullah, the friend of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yusuf, the son of Ya'qub alayhi salam, who is the son of Ishaq alayhi salam who is the son of Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam. What more of a noble and more great in lineage can you ask for when four, uh, four steps to your ancestors are all Rasul, and they are all the messengers of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What a greatness. Qalu, laysa hadha anna saluka, messenger of Allah, we're not asking you regarding that either. So Rasulullah says, Qal, fa'an ma'adin al-Arabi tas'aluni. Oh, are you asking me regarding the Arab tribes, that who's the best amongst the Arab tribes? Uh, they said, yes. Oh, yes, naam. This is what we're asking you. Rasulullah says, خِيَارُكُمْ فِي الْجَاهِلِيَّةِ خِيَارُهُمْ فِي الْإِسْلَامِ إِذَا فَقُهُ The best amongst those, that, uh, the best amongst these, these tribes are those that were the best and the noblest amongst you at the times of a jahiliya ignorance. But then they came unto Islam and they have become the best of Islam also. Umar radiyallahu ta'ala anhu, one of the noblest and the greatest amongst the Arabs. Abu Bakr radiyallahu ta'ala anhu, such a great great lineage, sort of man, a man of honor, a man of trust. When they came onto Islam, they became the best of Islam also. Usman radiallahu anhu, amongst the richest and the wealthiest in Mecca, Mukarrama. And after Islam, he is blessed to be who? Do you know what amazing about Usman radiallahu anhu? I was actually thinking the other day, do you know when a person marries and you have a father-in-law, so in front of your father-in-law, you know, you get shy, you know, that's my whore, what do you say, whore sub, and you know, that's my father-in-law, and you get all, uh, you know, shy around him, and you feel very like, okay, I have to be very controlled. My Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa had two father-in-laws also. His father-in-laws were Abu Bakr, radiallahu anhu, and Umar, radiallahu anhu. But the way he was with his father-in-laws, you know, he was, there was a lot of respect, a lot of love, but there wasn't that shyness. My Rasul also had from what we know, two uh, son-in-laws. Ali radiallahu anhu and Uthman radiallahu anhu. When it's your damant and it's your son-in-law, you chill out, oh, that's my damant, you know, there's nothing to be shy about. There's nothing to be, you know, like, oh, cautious about. Look at the life of my Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa Hadith of Al-Adab al-Mufrad and a hadith of Sahih Bukhari. My Rasul is sitting, shallow, in a sense that he's not sitting in his normal manner. You know, to the extent the sum of his jubba and his clothes that he's wearing is a bit raised and his chin is exposed. Rasulullah is leaning, relaxed. Abu Bakr comes in. Abu Bakr comes in, father-in-law, horse up. He comes in. <laughs> Nothing happens. No, he call it Urdu Susar. Susar. Is that what you say to father-in-law? Anyone know? In Urdu Susar. So Susar, father-in-law comes in. Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu. Rasulullah relaxed him. No problem. 
Umar radiyallahu anhu walks in. Rasulullah relaxed. Now look at my Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. His son-in-law, Uthman radiyallahu anhu walks in. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam reaches his clothes, sits with a more of a stutter, more of a respect. So Aisha radiyallahu anhu, when she narrates this hadith, she says that I don't understand. She says, Ya Rasulullah, when my father walked in, you were relaxed, and nothing, you know, you were, you were bothered. Umar radiyallahu anhu walked in. Who is Umar? We find in the hadith of Sahih Bukhari, Rasulullah and his wives are speaking to Rasulullah and they're raising their voices. They're speaking to Rasulullah, they're raising their voices. Umar, the footsteps and the voice of Umar can be heard. Umar walks in, all of the wives of Rasulullah go away. Rasulullah is laughing and smiling. Dahkan Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he starts to smile. And Umar is like, Ya Rasulullah, what's happened? You know, you're smiling, is anything wrong? And they say that, Ya Umar, you walk in and the wives of the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wasallam in front of Rasul, they're talking away, they're raising their voices. As soon as they hear Umar, they all go quiet and they've all walked away. This is Umar radiallahu anhu. Uthman walks in, Rasulullah does this. And Aisha says, with Umar, you didn't react. But when Uthman, who is your son-in-law, to blessed to have two of your daughters, Ummi Kulthum and Ruqiyya radiallahu ta'ala anhumah, why? Ya Aisha, should I not have haya, sharam, for that man whom even the angels of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have this sense of modesty and sharam in front of? This is Uthman radiallahu anhu. The, you know, that sense of haya that the angels have is not befitting that I have this sharam for Uthman radiallahu anhu. The Rasulullah says, Hadith of Ibn Majah, that every Nabi of Allah has a rafiq, has a neighbor and a close associate in Jannah. My Rafiq will be Uthman radiallahu anhu. So he has sharam and respect for his son-in-law. And you think, Ya Allah, my, the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is amazing. It's not based on the culture that we live in. It's based on who is the most noblest, who is the greatest, and who has a special feature in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's what really stands out. I pray that Allah makes me and you amongst those. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says this. The next hadith of my Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is an Ibn Mas'ud radiyallahu ta'ala anhu anna nabiyya nabiya sallallahu alayhi wa sallam kani yaqul Ibn Mas'ud radiyallahu ta'ala anhu says that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to say Allahumma inni as'aluka al-huda Oh my Allah, I ask from you al-huda I ask from you guidance Wat-tuqa, I ask from you taqwa So Rasulullah being the most noble, atqaakum. He says, I am the most pious. I am the one who has this quality of taqwa to its pinnacle. He himself is asking Allah for taqwa. From this we have to understand, this is something you have to ask for. Oh Allah, give me this concept of taqwa in my life. Oh Allah, I ask you for guidance, taqwa, wal afaf. I ask you for chastity. I ask you that you make me amongst the most noble, the most honored, wal ghina. And I ask that you make me independent, that I don't rely on people. I don't turn to people. I become an independent person who doesn't need to always look towards means and look towards people. I have this concept of if I'm going to ask anyone, first I'm going to ask Allah. I'm going to make my own way. I'm going to try first. I'm not going to ask people. I'm not going to go begging to anyone. I will become independent in my way. This is a very great attribute and we should work towards all of them. More so right now because the topic is taqwa. We should become amongst those who have taqwa. The final hadith for this topic that I'm going to mention um, is a very beautiful hadith wherein An Abi Umama Sadiyun bin Ajlan Bahiri radiyallahu ta'ala anhu qal Who is this companion Abu Umama? It's possible we never heard of his name before. Uh, Sadiyun bin Ajlan. He is that companion who lived in Syria. He lived in Syria. He accepted Islam on the hands of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He passed away at the year 81 after Hijri. He was the last companion to pass away in Syria. Last from all of the companions of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa This ummah has been blessed to receive 250 ahadith from Abu Umam radiallahu ta'ala anhu. This hadith is a very powerful hadith and I wish if I had time I would actually sit here trying to address to you the whole hadith. This hadith is a chunk of the final sermon of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa The Rasulullah sallallahu hajjatul wida on the 9th of Dhul Hijjah Arafah on the 10th year of Islam, when Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is going to meet his companions on this collective basis for the final time. It's the most emotional time for all of the companions of Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We find that there's over 100,000 companions there 
ready to listen to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Abbas radiyallahu anhu, because there was no mic system, but he has a very loud voice. He will be the one who will be repeating the words of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as a mic. And the people that can't hear will be hearing the voice of Abbas radiyallahu ta'ala anhu, very tall and with a very powerful, a loud voice. Here, from amongst the khutbah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Abu Umama says, سَمِعْتُ رَسُولَ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهُ وَسَلَّمْ يَخْتُبُ فِي حَجَّةِ الْوَدَاءِ That my Rasul and your Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam made this sermon on the Hajjat al-Wada, the final Hajj. Those of you that would be blessed to go to Hajj this year and whenever you get a chance and those of you that have been, may Allah take you more times over and over and over and again. This is something to really think about. On the day of Arafah, you should make it a point to read over this sermon in the English language. When you are sitting there in Arafah, think to yourself, there was a point where my Rasul and your Rasul was standing here and he was giving a message to all of his companions and for all that, that, that will come after him. From amongst the things my Rasul and your Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, he said, فَقَالْ إِتَّكُ اللَّهِ Fear the displeasure of Allah. To all Sahaba, all my companions, all my Ummah, fear the displeasure of Allah. وَصَلُّوا خَمْسَكُمْ And offer the five daily prayers. Your five daily prayers, start offering them. Allah has seen, we look for so many uh, avenues to connect to Allah. Let me tell you what the connection to Allah is. It's salah. Before anything else, we need to really work on our salah. We shouldn't be lazy with our salah. We should make an active effort with our salah. Our salah is very important. We find in hadith, we've heard so many times, salah on a believer is like the head. Without the head, you have nothing. Salah is very, very important. It's a very precious gift, and it should not be just a custom. Allah, as in we have become such people that it's a habit, it's just a few, you know, different ways of acting out something. We go to ruku, we go to sajda, no meaning, nothing behind it. Ask that person who's accepted Islam, <coughs> and after he's understood the concept of salah, compare his salah and my salah, compare his, their salah. Because they understand that I am prostrating in front of my Creator, Allah. I have heard that the Rasul has said, you are closest to Allah in prostration. I have heard that when I'm standing here and I am in my salah with a true, true salah, not only my minor sins, the ulama say your major sins can be forgiven with a true salah, with khushu, with a lot of devotion, with a lot of attention. So my Rasul says to me and you, the fear the displeasure of Allah and please, wasallu khamsakum, offer your salah on time. Don't make an excuse. Don't make an excuse. Offer your salah. Wasumu shahrakum. And the blessed month of Ramadan that comes to your month, Make sure you fast in that month. وَأَدُّوا زَكَاةَ أَمْوَالِكُمْ And those of you who have to give the zakah of your wealth, that you have reached the actual minimum and then nisab, then you should be giving your zakah once a year. وَأَتِيُوا أُمَرَاهَكُمْ Make sure you listen to your leaders. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is saying to his companions, that make sure you listen to your leaders. He is the leader at that moment. But because he is giving that indirect message now, that listen to your leaders, those that will come after me now. Make sure you hold on to them. Obey them. Tadhulu jannata rabbikum. If you do these things, then you will enter the jannah, the promise of your creator, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In that final sermon, my Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam also said, that, Oh my companions, oh my companions, it is possible that this is the final time that you will see me. It is possible that this is our last gathering together like this. And I want to say a few words to you. Amongst them he said, that look after your women folk, look after your wives, look after your daughters. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam gave these advices. We find, I was just looking up before I came, that some ulama have said that Surah Al-Nas was revealed around that time. Surah Al-Nas, Ida Jaa Nasrullahi wal Fat. We find two different uh, points. We find that Abbas radiallahu anhu, while this sermon is going on, he's crying. We also find Abu Bakr is crying. But we will use the focus of Abu Bakr right now. Abu Bakr is crying. Crying profusely, everyone is celebrating on these verses and on this whole gathering that when Islam started 23 years back, 22 years back, few, few Muslims hiding away, they were chucked out, they were kicked out of Makkah Mukarramah. After so many years, nearly 20 years, they come back. Rasulullah comes with an army of 10,000 companions. Two years later, we're talking 100,000 companions are in front of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. I don't know any other man, any other person that can say that in that short period of time had has that much success in their life. This is my Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Everyone cheerful. إِذَا جَاءَ نَصْرُ اللَّهِ وَالْفَاتِ That indeed the help of Allah has come, success has come. We've done it, Rasulullah has seen it now. Allah promised him that you'll come back to Makkah, he's come back. 
Mecca is his, everything in front of him, everyone's happy. And there you find Abu Bakr crying his eyes out. Ibn Anas radiallahu ta'ala anhu wa Ibn Abbas says that indeed Abu Bakr, he was the most knowledgeable of us all. He is crying, crying, crying. And everyone is there cheerful. Why does he cry? Because he sees something that no one else sees. You're all clouded in your happiness. Where Abu Bakr sees that this means something. This means that the time of Rasulullah on the face of this earth has come to an end. That's it now. His time on the face of this earth has come to an end. He's going to leave us. He's the only one that's understanding that part. His foresight has taken him to that conclusion. Not this success. That this individual that through all our lives that I've been with him, who can claim to be with Rasulullah more than Abu Bakr? Umar says, I swear by Allah, everything in my life, every achievement of my life, put it aside, I swear by Allah, I'm willing to sacrifice everything that I've achieved if Allah was to give me them three days that Abu Bakr had. The three days where he had Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa by himself. This is Abu Bakr. And he's there crying his eyes out. Why? Because now my Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, his life, his mission, he's done it. But he's going to leave us. This is something that we miss out. We look at apparent things, we're happy with certain things. We don't see far beyond what we're meant to see. And to be that, you need to spend time with them people. Abu Bakr sees that thing that no one else sees. And it's that very Abu Bakr when Rasulullah, he's, le- he's left the world. Where everyone else has you know, lost it. Umar radiallahu in the masjid of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that whosoever says that Rasulullah has passed away, I will take your head. Mughayra, who is with uh, Hazrat uh, Umar, who saw the body of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he is saying, Qad mata Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Messenger of Allah has passed away. Munafiq, ya Munafiq, oh you hypocrite, how dare you say that? Umar, in his own, lost in his own thoughts, angry. But how can you say that Rasulullah has passed away? Uthman sitting there, doesn't know what's going on. We find regarding Ali radiallahu anh, unconscious in the masjid of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Everyone. Everyone's emotions now is playing on them. Sahaba radiallahu sitting in pockets. What do we do? You know, what's going to happen? The Ansar are sitting in a few pockets of their own. Everyone's everywhere. Abu Bakr is returning. He leaves the Fajr Salah. He goes for some business on the outskirts of Medina. He comes back. The one that you think that he'll break down. The one that Aisha says that, Oh Rasulullah, my father shouldn't leave the Salah. He can't stand in your place. He'll be crying. That very Abu Bakr now he returns. And now he sees his Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. O oh, Messenger of Allah, you were beautiful in life, and now even at this moment you are completely beautiful. He kisses his Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa The one that you think that won't be able to know anything and do anything, he leaves the quarter of Aisha radiallahu anha and he says, Umar, come, Umar, Ijlis, sit down, Umar. Umar is still going on, shouting. Abu Bakr radiallahu anha comes to the member of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and then he gives his sermon. Whosoever amongst you worship Muhammad, then know that Muhammad today is no more. Whosoever amongst you worships Allah, then know that Allah is ever living and Allah is the one who will always remain. And then he recites the verses of Surah Ali Imran. وَمَا مُحَمَّدٌ إِلَّا رَسُولٌ قَدْ خَلَتْ مِنْ قَبْلِهِ رسول. Muhammad is but a Rasul. Before him, many other Rasul have come and they've gone. Umar says, we felt as though this is the first time this is being said to us. This is the pain that they felt. And that Abu Bakr that you thought won't do anything, won't know anything, he is the Abu Bakr addressing the companions, keeping everyone together. Why? Because that company made him. He became so that we find when they came to Medina Munawwara, Abu Bakr looked older than the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Though Rasulullah was approximately two years older than him. People came to the Abu Bakr. People came to him shaking his hand. Ya Rasulullah, he's there shaking the hands of everyone. Whereas Rasulullah is coming to Medina Munawwara, shaking the hands, shaking the hands, thinking, this is our Rasul. Because Rasulullah is the young, handsome man that's probably just the one that's with the Rasul. Shaking his hand, shaking his hand. Rasulullah is now sitting, and the sunlight and the shade on the rays of the sun are now on the face of Rasulullah. That very Abu Bakr is seeing that now my Rasul doesn't need me to stand here and take the, you know, the hardship of standing after a long journey and shaking everyone's hand and allowing everyone to meet you. Abu Bakr now he reacts. That now my Rasul needs me to be a shade for him. And he takes his garment and he makes a shade for Rasul. And then everyone realizes, this was not Rasul. This is the Rasul of Allah. But this is what taqwa, this is what these concepts teach you. It teaches you how to act. 
There's a saying in Urdu and it's in English too, that love teaches you adab. Love teaches you how to react with yours. Love teaches you these qualities that no one can teach you. This is why, though I'm a believer of, you know, we should read, we should understand the book of Allah, we should understand hadith, there is something else I'm very passionate about, and that is companionship. I'm very passionate about suhbat, company of the pious servants of Allah. It is not mere book reading. It is not mere opening a book of hadith and then me narrating to you hadith, hadith, hadith. That is not enough. I myself, you yourselves, have to become an embodiment. We have to become, and I love this word, a physical exegesis of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa We need to become that. We need to become those now that if I am silent, then in my silence you are learning and you have gained so much knowledge that through my speech you won't be able to take that from me anymore. This is what we need to become. My Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he was upset and angry. He didn't shout and scream. His face said it all. The taghayyara wajhun nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The face of my Rasul changed and we realized that, okay, we need to stop now. Our silence should be so loud. Our lives should be like of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. My Rasul's companions, we don't call them friends. We don't call them students. We don't call them his juniors. We say ashab, suhbat, sahib. That this is Sahibu Rasulullah, the companion, the one that spent time with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That is the honor of their title. It isn't that he is known to be the what? The muta'allim al nabi He is the student of Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. No. Talibu, you know, ilm. No, nothing of that sort. And that's what we lack today. Wallah, as in we come to these gatherings <coughs> of bayans and talks, learn, learn to become a means of goodness for each other. Feed off each other's like, uh, positivity. Let your goodness, you know, actually go and, you know, go and shove off onto someone else. This is what company makes of you. And this is what we need in our lives. This is why when I say spirituality, Hakim Akhtar Sab says, Na kitabu se na zar se peyda. Ye deen jo hasil hota hai, buzurgo ki nazar se peyda. That this deen of Allah, it is not me a book reading. And you myself, I have gone through a few different avenues of my life where I kind of, made my attention go towards other things. I thought it was, initially I thought that yeah, you need the company of five people. Then I lacked on knowledge, I lacked on reading. Then I went too much into reading. And then I came back to the same conclusion. I need reading, I need this. But before this, I need a living example. I need the company of the pious servants of Allah. That's why when I, I can sit here, you know, look, lecturing and looking over every commentary of, say, of you know, Riyadh al salin of Sahih Bukhari, of Sahih everything, when I sit in the class of my teachers and what I get from them, Wallahi Lazim, no, no book, no commentary can do for me what my teachers can do for me. And you know, I'm not just making this up. I'll give you an incident and I'll finish on this. Hafiz ibn Hajj al he does say that dreams are not the end all and everything, but it is a sign, it is an alamat from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's a mubasharat and basharat, it's a goodness. <coughs> In our class, the hadith class that we sit in, this is being recorded, this is going to go back, you can ask my teachers. In the class of Sahih Bukhari, we have had such students that sit in the dars, you know, where 40, 50 people are sitting. And when you have a long day, right now, my class for a few days is 6 till 6 now. I have 12 hour classes and it's very tiring, I won't lie to you. I mean, Rabbil Alameen. That's how long it is. There have been students that have sat in our classes of Sahih Bukhari, Sahih Muslim, that they're in class, they're getting tired, and they're dozing off, and the teacher's in front of them, they're dozing off. And you know when you just doze off sitting down, that's probably one of the best sleeps you can get, by the way. You're just sitting down and you're dozing off. A student, he's dozing off, he's dozed off, you know, probably two, three minutes. In them two, three minutes, he sees Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Oh, what are you doing? Wake up. He's teaching my words, listen to him. And he wakes up, <gasps> screaming. Everyone's like, what's happened? He says, I have just seen Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in my dream. I've just seen the man that we're sitting here discussing his words. His words. He is saying to me, wake up and listen to your teacher. Why he's saying he's discussing my words. Listen to him. And this, I'm not talking, you know, 50 years ago, 100 years ago, you know, the Salaf Salihin and the pious predecessors. I'm talking of men that my teachers speak of in the last three, four years. That's what I'm talking about. I'm talking about my teachers, that child who's in year seven, he sees in a dream that in our class of Sahih Bukhari, about our respected teacher, Mufti Shabir Sahib, who has been teaching hadith for the last 38 years now, he's teaching the dars of hadith, and this 12, 13-year-old child, who right now is not, he's very innocent, he's not in a path of sin, 
He's very pure. He sees in a dream. He writes this dream. I have a WhatsApp of this dream. On my old phone, not on this right now. I have a WhatsApp of this dream where this child wrote it. That I was sitting in the class of Sahih Bukhari. Mufti Shabir Sahib is teaching. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam walks in. And he sits amongst the teachers. And he listens to Mufti Shabir Sahib give the dars and the lesson of hadith. It's not a joke. It's not a joke. This is not a joke. These are not just mere words. They are the words of your and my Habib sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And this is a route towards taqwa. Route towards piety. And a realm that, wallahi, as if you have not tasted then you don't know what we're talking about. This apparent is a knowledge, but this is also a very deep knowledge. And that will not come just from reading, reading, reading. The conclusion is, for that, you will have to attach yourself to the pious servants of Allah. And you know, all them, we are, we are very fortunate. I hope Ustaj is not listening right now, but Wallahi Lazim, in my eyes, from amongst all my teachers, in all them right now, those that I look towards and those that I'm willing to sacrifice my life for, Amongst them is Mulana Kamal Sahib. And you've met Mulana Kamal Sahib, whose school that we're sitting in right now. His, this is Westwood Hall. Westwood High is his. He is such a man that, that his students are present, my friends are present. They will witness and testify to this. Such men that when you spend time with them, you know, when they're in a mood and they tell you those things, those things that you'll never understand. It's those lessons, those points that only a pious servant of Allah will tell you. It's why there is a hadith. I have seen this hadith in Mali al Quran by Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu. The pious servant of Allah is that person. When you look towards him, you see him, you recognize, and you remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He reminds you of Allah. When you speak to him, every time you speak to him, your knowledge regarding Allah, regarding this theme, it just increases. These are the qualities of these people. I pray Allah makes us them people, number one. All of us. Everyone. It's not about Atik, it's not about Hafiz, Murana, Sab. No, no, no. Nothing of that sort. Your Allah, my Allah is the same Allah. The heart that you have and the heart that I have, both of our hearts are capable. Don't let anyone ever tell you that you have to be super knowledgeable, super pious. I'm sorry. It's not like that. My Allah is very, very kind. My Allah's mercy is kind. Allah's friendship that when he gives it to someone is very kind. He will give to you. But you have to want it. So the first step towards taqwa, the first step towards change, only one thing. Want it. Say that you want it. Say that I'm not going to wait for tomorrow. I'm not going to wait for one week. I'm not going to wait for a month. I want it from now and I'm going to make an active effort. Your active effort may be that before you leave, you need to repent to Allah. My active effort may be when I go home, I need to cry to Allah, ask Him to bless me with sincerity. Your active effort may be that when you go home, you need to speak to your family members. Everyone's is different. But make a change. Don't go without making a change. Make Allah yours. I said this last week, I'll say it to you again. Agar tu hai mera, ta sab kuch hai mera. If you are mine, everything is mine. Zameen hai meri, falak hai mera. This earth, this heaven, whatever, everything becomes mine. To a point, jaha me dekhu, idhar dekhta hu, udhar dekhta hu. Sirf tu hi ko dekhta hu. Wherever I look, I look here, I look there, wherever, whatever I see, I only see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I sit in the company of hundreds, I sit in the company of 50 people, 30 people. But I swear by Allah, I am not sitting in the company of 30, 40, 50 hearts. My heart is only with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's what we need to become. I pray Allah allows me and you to understand this. Imam Nawi from his intentions, one was this. One of the reasons why he wrote this book is because so a person can learn to tread the path towards reaching Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. A path of spirituality. Pathway you can connect to the Almighty. May Allah ta'ala accept all of you. Forgive me for taking a lot of your time. May Allah accept from everyone. Allah keep us all sincere. Literally, one, two, two announcements. Our dear Abdul Aziz Bai has made a few more snacks and it's something different. It's a special um, omelette or something. Is it omelette? Is it very special omelette. Uh, it's going for two pounds and all the proceeds go towards Al Adab. We've got our famous, the famous now, Alhamdulillah, it's been going around quite a lot. Everyone's giving me pictures of how they're using it and it's going around family by family. May Allah accept. We've got famous, our famous now, uh, five different coats. Whichever one you fancy, you can pick up. It's five pound. Every profit goes towards another. You're helping us and you're also remembering us. Uh, Alhamdulillah, some people are messaged while seeing these as smileys are curved. I can straighten out many things. They have sent some pictures saying Ustadji or whoever. I'm thinking about you. I'm thinking about another. So it's a very, very beautiful sign. I pray that Allah keeps us all sincere. I pray Allah makes us true to our words. It's all talk for me, by the way. It's all talk. I'm actually very fake. Allah has been very fake. So I need it probably more than anyone else sitting here. 
Please make dua for me that Allah makes it reality in my life. Allah make me truly sincere and Allah allow me to have patience. Allah allow me to have taqwa. Allah accept from everyone sitting here from us all. May Allah always keep us together in this world. And may the Almighty Allah reunite us in Jannah al-Firdaus. And we have our Monday Tafsir class, those of you that are free. Same time, 9 till 10. We are discussing the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on Mondays. Jazakallah khayran. Subhanallah wa bihamdihi. Subhanallah iladheem. Astaghfirullah wa atubu ilayhi. Wa la hawla wa la quwata illa billahi